Hi there, welcome to IndyCar on, what is it, the 20th today? Let me just check, make sure I've got my dates correct. Wednesday the 20th of March. Now, in thinking about what I was going to talk to you about on this programme, I decided to take a little bit of a detour. But it's an important detour, because I think this period in Scottish history marks a big change in the political fortunes of this country. If you're unfortunate enough to be an independence campaigner who ventures onto what used to be known as Twitter, now called X, you would probably be surrounded by trolls, as I have been every time I've been on X. In fact, um, X seems to be a troll festival for unionists, uh, and in fact it's a place where they just wait for anyone, like myself, to venture on there and say that independence is a good idea, and then they all pile on. Now that's what you would expect, and this is the reason why most independence campaigners abandoned Twitter years ago in favour of what was at the time a more civilised uh, debating arena on Facebook and on other social mediums, or media, sorry. but. The, the fact of the matter is that we can't live in denial any longer. Devolution has been a raging success, but not for us. It's been a massive success for the British state. Devolution, when it was first touted, was intended to give the Scots a taste of self-governance, but without any meaningful powers to achieve independence. And so it was always resisted initially by the SNP when it was first mooted. Now, in 1997, when there was a referendum to decide whether there should be a reopening and a reconvening of the Scottish Parliament, there was a massive majority for it. 75%, I think, of the Scottish population voted in favour of it because we were sick of having decisions made for us in a foreign country's capital in London. And so the decision-making process for our internal governance was to be shifted to Edinburgh. Now, in that respect, it created the impression that we had some agency, we had some power back. And we did. <clears throat> in fact, we still do. But that power is inten intentionally restricted simply to local parochial matters. The Scottish Parliament was, and still is, essentially a giant local authority. It's intended to give us the impression that we have some power to change things locally at our own level but without any political power uh, to break free of the Union. And in that respect, the devolution settlement has been an enormous success for the United Kingdom because they always knew that because the United Kingdom controlled access to Scotland's uh, taxation, its funding, its revenues, and could withhold them at any time it liked, there was always the opportunity to spring that trap if the Scottish Parliament or if the, the government which was elected to serve that Parliament and the people got the idea that it should have another independence referendum. Now, Alex Salmond was the only Scottish leader who ever achieved an outright political majority in Holyrood, something which was meant to be impossible to achieve because of the safeguards put in place by the hybrid voting system, which had a bit of first-past-the-post and a bit of kind of proportional representation to allow unionists to occupy seats in Holyrood, which they had not actually won in a first-past-the-post election system like the UK has. And so that created a, a parliament which was stuffed with, well, let's say, undeserving uh, unionist candidates who didn't make it in the first vote but were given the consolation prize of the seat. And the intention there was to retain a balance, a presence of unionist influence in the Scottish Parliament. Now, having said all of that, um, Scottish politicians, of course, are effectively a branch of the British state apparatus. Originally, the Scottish Parliament was called, well, certainly by the Labour Party, was known as the Scottish Executive. And to be honest with you, that's probably a fairer method of, uh, uh, of, ex of describing what it does. It is the, uh, the Scottish branch of the British government in Scotland executing, shall we say, local legislation at a local base, on a local basis. Except that the funding for these local uh, pieces of legislation comes from Westminster, because we send all our taxes there and they keep some of it and send back whatever they think we should have. And of course that has been diminishing greatly recently. Now when the Parliament opened and Alex Salmond succeeded and we got that referendum in 2014, the United Kingdom very nearly lost its grip 
on Scotland as a colony, because it really is a colony. Let's face it, we, we're not in a union voluntarily. And those, of, those unionists who claim that we voted no because we didn't want to be independent um, are basically misrepresenting a lot of the fear that was engendered during that referendum campaign by the no campaign. Anyway, that is history. The point of what I'm saying to you today is that this period of Scottish history is now at a close. Devolution has worked for England as Britain. It's served its purpose, which was to prevent Scotland from leaving the United Kingdom, but giving us just enough agency to satisfy our longing to have local decisions made here, but at the same time denying us any chance of voting to leave the Union. Uh, and so that's not going to change. The parliamentarians we currently have, including the First Minister and the Scottish Government, or Executive, or whatever you want to call it, are also hamstrung by the same system. They can't operate outside of it. They have no political power outside of local affairs. They are basically superannuated, supercharged local authority uh, officials, councillors, who basically just decide where money is spent. But that money is not decided by us. The funding that we have available to us is not decided by us. So no matter what the SNP government decided to do, and whatever progressive legislation, social or otherwise, it chose to enact, was always, always going to be um, sabotaged by the United Kingdom by simply cutting the funding. And so it's very easy for any unionist on X or any other social medium to say that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government in particular were incompetent because they couldn't enact the legislation which they were passing uh, and they hadn't funded it properly and so it collapsed and so we get claims that things like the ferries weren't built on time. Now the ferries incidentally are probably an outlier because the ferries were bungled and we all know that and I think everybody admits that. But things like dueling the A9, for example, which is a very lengthy, costly process, is often dredged up as a reason why the Scottish Government has failed, among other things. And then we've got the Gender Recognition Reform Act, which nobody liked at all, and various other acts, such as um, the Hate Bill, which is, uh, or Hate Crimes Bill, which is now about to come into force in April. All of these uh, pieces of legislation were unpopular with the public, um, deemed unnecessary or badly timed, and a lot of the legislation which they were replacing already served the same purpose, maybe wasn't quite as targeted. But the point I'm trying to make here is no matter what the SNP government does now, or did then, um, since that 2014 referendum result, the British government had no intentions of ever letting the SNP government, in inverted commas, which it got used to calling itself, um, was ever going to get enough power to do anything politically about the union. The constitutional question is off the table, and it remains off the table. I had suspected for a long time that the Tories would eventually abolish devolution and return to centralising control, but I think they would only do that if they felt they had lost control of the situation here. But now they've re-established that control, my guess is that the British state will want to keep devolution in place because it serves two purposes. By giving us two governments, it means that the cost of governing Scotland is far higher than it ought to be. And that guarantees that any Scottish government of any political stripe will always be accused of failing to govern properly because it doesn't have sufficient funding. And it doesn't have sufficient funding, of course, because the United Kingdom is going to cut it. And that means no matter what the Scottish government does to try and improve things here, it will be a failure because it's already been predetermined that it should be by London. So at the end of the day, I know this sounds defeatist, but let's, let's face up to reality here. We've been snookered here by the United Kingdom. There's no political means for Scottish parliamentarians or elected officials of any colour at all to do anything about the constitutional issues that Scotland faces. But, and this is where the but comes in, Un <laughs> unlikely as it might seem, the actual support for independence is still rock solid. Various polls have been showing uh, figures of over 50%. These are challenged by 
many people, politicians, pundits, and not just uh, from the unionist side, about being over-optimistic. However, if we take it for granted that, let us say, independent support is evenly balanced at about 50%, then even with that balance, there is no political method, there is no uh, political mechanism, there's no votes, there's no dem democratic means of gaining our independence because we're being denied that democracy by the major state, the United Kingdom or London. And so our politicians are largely redundant. They're an extra layer of government which the United Kingdom is going to keep in place so that it can keep pointing to them and saying they're costing so much money, we are having to keep feeding more money to the Scottish government. They're spending more than they take in tax. It's ridiculous. But of course, all the time knowing that this extra layer of government is precisely the reason why they get to make this criticism. That leaves the Scottish people who do want independence, and there are still many millions of us who want to do this, in a situation where if you want the job done properly, then we've got to do it ourselves. There is no point in expecting politicians who are legally and constitutionally bound to a monarchy of another state and a government and a, a parliament in another state. There is no way they can act uh, against that. They're not going to challenge it. They can't, for, for one thing. They, they would be pilloried, they would be ruined. Look at what happened to Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon uh, and Craig Murray and there are so many people that they've ruined who stuck their heads over the parapet. Even t Tommy Sheridan in his day, after leading the poll tax rebellion, which actually succeeded incidentally, uh, they ruined him as well. They ruined his reputation, they find a weak spot in somebody's personality and dig up a skeleton from the past and they are team media as the rest. So no politician's going to want to put themselves through that, or their family through that. Nobody would want to do that. And that leaves the Scottish population, effectively most of us, depoliticised. At least 50% of the Scottish population no longer cares about politics. They've, they've decided that it's a busted flush. They might as well forget it. And that is precisely what the devolution settlement was designed to do, was to create that sense of hopelessness, the pointlessness of trying to resist it's a bit like the Daleks. Resistance is futile. You can't escape. You know, we're, you're going to be assimilated. In fact, we have been assimilated. And I made that comment earlier today on Twitter that we are assimilated into the British state, whether we wanted to be or not. I know there are plenty of wealthy Scots, those in the middle classes and upper middle classes, who've had a, a nice life because of being in the union. They work for companies that are part of the union apparatus and their entire future and the security of their wealth is basically at risk, as they see it, if Scotland became independent. So you can understand why many people don't want to vote yes when they already have a comfortable life because of being in the union and because of their work in association with that union. That leaves the rest of us wondering how we're going to get free of England at all and you know, for Scotland to break free of the Union and to make its own choices and make better choices and have a single layer of government which we can afford instead of two. But of course that's not going to happen, that's what devolution is there to do, it's a trap. It always was a trap and it remains so. So what's necessary now is for our independence to become an issue of human rights because the right uh, to self-determination is a fundamental and universal human right which is underwritten in the very Charter of the United Nations which was written in the 1960s <coughs> and in which the United Kingdom was asked about Scotland's status in the Union and the United Nations was assured that Scotland was in a voluntary Union. Everybody in Scotland wanted to be in the Union, of course we did. In 1707 there was a massive referendum, wasn't there, in which millions of Scots voted gladly to become part of the United Kingdom. Except we know that's all a load of nonsense. But that's the, the de facto position at the moment. The UN accepted the United Kingdom's assurances at the time and regards the UK as a unitary state for diplomatic purposes, which is what they would do. So our issue now is we need to get enough Scots, and I'm talking about a numerical majority of voting age Scots 
to become part of the liberation movement so that we can make representations to be decolonized and to have democracy restored so that we can vote on our own self-determination, our own future. It's a fundamental human right. And the union and the devolution settlement that it created have now shown that they hold a stranglehold over Scotland's funding. And so no matter what any Scottish government does, its plans will fail because the United Kingdom can choke the funding off while all the unionist um, trolls can run around shouting, ah, well, you can't afford it, and you're incompetent, you're making up laws and you can't afford to enact any of them. And of course, that's true. But of course, they don't tell you that it's because the United Kingdom has chopped the funding uh, and prevented that Scottish government from succeeding. So we're stuck uh, basically in a bind. We can't get out of this politically. We can't expect our politicians to do anything about it. We have to take the action ourselves, and that means a popular movement. We have heard about popular sovereignty. We know that we are sovereign. We have that guarantee in our own founding constitutional documents, both the Declaration of Abroad from 1320, which established the Scottish state as a popular sovereignty where the people were sovereign over their own monarch and could remove that monarch or government if they failed to look after the rights of the citizens. So we've got that. We also know from the claim of right that that sovereignty is guaranteed. And in fact, even the king himself has sworn an oath to uphold the claim of right, which guarantees that sovereignty. <clears throat> so we've got these documents. We can take that with us to this legal um, representation that we have to make to the international authorities who decide such matters. But the right to self-determination is a human right. The right to democracy is a human right. And these are things which are being denied to Scots at the moment and will continue to be denied for as long as the British state exists. So I'm appealing to every one of you today who's thinking, God, you know, why are we bothering doing this? People often ask me, why do you keep buying this drum? Peter Bell summed it up nicely. It's not about economics. It's not about uh, how much money Scotland has or how successful it would be or its resources or anything like that. It's about the fundamental human right of all peoples to determine their own futures, guaranteed in the Charter of the United Nations. It's a fundamental normal. Countries that are normal govern themselves. They do not permit another country to do it for them. The United Kingdom has successfully depoliticized a huge chunk of the Scottish voting, uh, voting age electorate by basically putting them off using their vote for anything, by convincing them that politics is something they shouldn't concern themselves about, leave that to the big boys in London. It's not worth the hassle, it's not worth the trouble, you will be castigated, your name will be dragged through the mud if you stick your head above the parapet. But not if we do this en masse, not if a million and a half, two million of us actually sign and join Liberation Scotland and start to campaign with Salvo to send a representation to the United Nations to claim our right to self-determination, our human right to um, democracy, which is what the United Kingdom claims to be, and yet denies 5.5 million Scots the opportunity to vote on their own future. So it's a big topic today, um, but I think it's worth outlining the fact that I think the devolution era has been a massive success for the UK and a huge catastrophe for Scotland as a nation itself. Um, from a political point of view, Scotland is an outlier. It's abnormal. It's a bizarre, um, bizarre place to live where people want to be impoverished by the nation next door. They want their funding cut. They want their government here to fail. Uh, they want Scotland to look silly. They want Scotland to seem too small and too stupid to govern itself. For a very brief moment, Alex Salmond and the SNP in its early days of government in Holyrood proved that Scotland could self-govern. Just for that brief few years, we showed that we could have a successful parliament. And as a staging post to independence, that was where the independence referendum should have led to us leaving the United Kingdom, but didn't. And it didn't because of fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of change, fear of what the United Kingdom would do to us if we had the temerity to vote to leave. 
But now I think it's time basically to um, to grow up and grow a pair ourselves and get out there and actually campaign to get our democracy back. And that's not going to happen in the United Kingdom. We can't go to the Supreme Court or or Holyrood or Westminster with this argument. We have to go to somebody much more powerful than that with all the legal documentation to prove our sovereignty and demand that we have our democracy back. And that's it. That's where we're at at the moment. And so that is what I would say to you. And if you are challenged by any unionist trolls, you just point out to them that you're being denied a basic human right to democracy. And that is as simple as it gets. There is nothing more to it. We are being denied democracy. We are not being given that human right. So I said from IndyCar today, something to think about and chew on, but get along to Salvo, sign the document at Liberation uh, Scotland, sign the declaration, the Edinburgh Declaration, that you want Scotland to be an independent country and that you're prepared to join the rest of the movement in making representations to the United Nations, the European Union, the Council of Europe and any other international bodies which adjudicate such things. The International Court of Justice is another one. It's going to be a long process though. It's not going to happen easily. The British state is going to grasp Scotland in a death grip rather than do any kind of investment in its own infrastructure. It will use ours in a parasitic relationship which has gone on far too long. Anyway, that's it for me today. I hope you've enjoyed today's programme. As usual, if you want to donate, there is a link. Uh, I think it's still posted on my page at the moment. Because I'm using my personal page, obviously my audience numbers are less than normal. So please share this with every single pro-independence friend, follower, and every social medium that you have access to. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.